Yo, what up? We're back, and this time it's for one of the biggest cards of the year at UFC 243. So first off, I just want to say, uh, make sure to comment, like, subscribe, uh, leave some comments down there who you're betting on, who you like to win. Uh, if you're going to the card, you know, I want to hear all about all that because it's going to be a pretty sick crowd. I bet like 100,000 people, it's going to be pretty fucking crazy. But, uh, you know, the first fight of the night with uh, Kali Taha and Bruno Silva, it's actually a pretty good fight. And Kali Ta is going to be looking to build off that 25-second upset knockout where he fought Boston Salmon. And Ta, he moved his training camp to AKA, so he should be improving. But he has been kind of jumping from camp to camp here. He did go from AKA to, uh, or I mean, I think he was at Team Alpha Male for his last camp. Now he's at AKA, but he's going to be facing a UFC newcomer in Bruno Silva. And Taha, he is a solid striker. He has heavy leg kicks, uh, nice jab. Everyone saw his power in his last fight against Boston Salmon. Nice one-two. And a very powerful uh, right hand. You know, straight right hand, his overhand, his right hook. I mean, if he lands that clean, he could put you out cold. And he throws a really nice left hook to the body to left hook to the head. Or a left hook to a straight left hand combination. Or a left hook to the body to a straight left hand and uh, he likes to throw front kicks to the body, and he's definitely fast, but he doesn't throw a lot of kicks besides leg kicks, and he can be a little bit obvious load up sometimes. I feel like Silva's faster, a little bit better with his movement. Possibly he's going to be able to move and counter with kicks, and Taha does hold his hands low, but Taha is dangerous, man, and inside he'll swing wild hooks, uppercuts, and if he lands clean, he can knock you out. He has eight knockouts, and he's never been finished with strikes. He's very durable. And Taha, he's not a super active grappler. I haven't seen him shoot many takedowns from range. I have seen Taha get a few body lock takedowns. And he has some decent top control, especially from half guard. But doesn't really posture up or do much damage from there. He really does his best work in top position when he's in the full guard of his opponent and gets to stand up and land some... Uh, you know, p long punches from inside their guard. And he's pretty good at pressure passing, and you'll go from side control to the back. But overall, he won't really look to wrestle very often. And he did lose his UFC debut by getting grinded out. He is explosive, though. And early on, he has good get ups. He's hard to get in on. But his technique off his back isn't great. And um, once the fight, you know, starts progressing and he slows down a little bit, he. Doesn't have the greatest ability to stand up when he's taken down or ability to chain wrestle. And he was taken down, you know, a lot, especially as the fight went on by Nadir Amani. But Nadir Amani is a 145er, so he is going to be sick, bigger than his opponent Bruno Silva here. So that is a game changer for him where in that fight he was smaller. And he will use submissions to create scrambles to stand up in his guard. But he could be a little bit sloppy with it, give his back... Give his neck. He got guillotined in a recent fight that he had in Ryzen. And Taha in this fight, though, I think he's going to be trying to defend the takedowns, keep it on the feet, get the knockout. But he has to be able to feign himself in the boxing range. He can't stay outside at the kicking range of uh, Silva. And, um, you know, try to back him up towards the cage. But be composed in the way that you're attacking. Use feints, use long punches, and um, try to take him out that way. And if you hurt him, you know, going for the kill, obviously. But um, you can't give up the takedowns or the clinch. Taha does have two submissions. He has been submitted twice himself. For Bruno Silva, he has won back-to-back -back fights, and he's 11-3-1. Silva has also participated in uh, Ultimate Fighter Brazil, and he was 1-1 one one on the show. So he has some experience in the UFC or, you know, Zufa, I guess. Silva has also been, you know, a training partner for Henry Cejudo for years. And Bruno Silva is a very well-rounded fighter. He's a great kicker, but um, he doesn't have the greatest hands. He has a very good uh, and fast jab, decent hooks, good one-twos, but holds his hands low. When he brings his hands back too slow after throwing punches, he can get tagged clean. And Silva tends to be on the outside, throw a lot of kicks and time takedowns. Extremely fast, good movement, nice round kicks, front kicks. Body kicks, he'll throw some spinning kicks. He's very fluid. You know, this guy's very athletic. You'll see him doing back flips, front flips at the weigh ins, and uh, really nice uh, front leg side kicks, body head. And if Silva gets down the outside, uses kicks, he becomes a pretty good striker because he gets confident. Fighters have to overextend. He'll catch him with the fast punches, get the takedowns, and, you know, that's where he starts to really implement his game plan. And I haven't been able to watch his last two fights, but. 
For a guy like this who's training with such a good camp, I do expect improvements every time out there. He's a great athlete. And he has four knockouts, and he has been knocked out one time. He was finished in seven seconds by a head kick in the fight where he was uh, knocked out. But Bruno Silva, you know, his game is really grappling. He's a black belt in jiu-jitsu. And obviously, he trains with Henry Cejudo, Patricio Pitbull, and one of the best wrestling coaches in MMA, and Eric Albatacin. And Silva, you know, he digs double unhooks excellently, has great control against the cage, throws really nice knees to the legs, to the body, nice double or nice body locks, good trips. And he'll duck under into double legs also, and good timing on his shots. On top, he has good control. He's aggressive. He likes to progress to the mount or the back. Uh, multiple rear naked choke victories. And Silva has uh, good ground and pound. He uses that to pass. And he can grind for three rounds. He definitely has the cardio. In this fight, I expect to utilize a heavy dose of wrestling if he is to win. I expect Silva's wrestling to be improved under Eric Abadassin, under Henry Cejudo. Not under Henry Cejudo, but training with Henry Cejudo. And I haven't seen many people try to take Silva down. In his fight with Casey Kenny, he denied a couple takedowns pretty easily. And then Kenny never really shot again. And Silva was actually the one... He was getting the takedowns, getting the dominant clinch position, and Kenny's proven to be a pretty good grappler. He was 2-0 in the UFC, won both of his fights uh, in grappling heavy performances, and him and Silva went to a draw, which I thought Bruno Silva deserved to win, so that was a good performance by him, and Silva has been submitted two times. He was caught in a guillotine in on tough against uh, Delano Lopez, actually, but he does have three submissions. And in this fight, I expect improvements from Silva. I already think he's a good wrestler, kicker, a great athlete. If he shores up his hands a bit and improves his entries into his wrestling shots, he could be a very good fighter. And Taha, he did get a 25-second knockout in his last match. Definitely has power, definitely is dangerous. But in my opinion, that overinflated his value here. And Taha struggles with wrestling. Uh, he struggled with the wrestling of Nad Nirmani. And Nad isn't as high level on the mat as Bruno Silva. The only trepidation I really have here is the size difference, and um, Silva usually fights at 125, but I expect him a surprise here, and I'm going to pick Bruno Silva via decision. I like the camp that he's at. You know, we just saw Patricio Pippo have a dominant performance. Henry Cejudo is obviously dominating, and, uh, you know, that's paid dividends here for Bruno Silva training with those guys. He's a guy that's evolving, and I think that he has the ability to be a good fighter, so I'm going to go with Bruno Silva here. I'm going to trust the skills over the size, the power. And uh, pick Bruno Silva to take a decision. And uh, up next here we have a women's fight with uh, Nadia Kasim taking on Ji Young Kim. And Ji Young Kim, you know, she's getting back on the horse after that loss uh, late last year to Antonina Shevchenko. This will be her first fight in 2019. And Kim has been staying busy during her time off. She spent a lot of time uh, working on her MMA game even when she didn't have a fight schedule. She was uh, at Alliance MMA. She put in a five-week training camp there for this fight, but she's been there previously, even before I've noticed from her Instagram. And, you know, I do expect her to look improved, obviously, with better coaching, training partners. And Kim did have some issues making weight in her last fight. She weighed in at 130 pounds. And with this fight being in Australia, you know, I could see that being a tough weight cut for her. But Jiang Kim, you know, she's a big fighter for the weight class. Long reach, six-inch reach advantage in this fight. And she's almost solely a boxer. Her footwork, especially early in fights, can kind of be lacking. She can be a little bit plodding, a little bit flat-footed. She does have a nice jab straight right hand. Throws a one-two or a left hook straight right hand combination. And she loves the left hook straight or overhand right combo. She throws it often, very you know, powerful with that. She'll throw a large volume of punches at times. And then other times she can be very low volume. So it's kind of hard to get a read on her. Kind of, she kind of lacks. Um, it's kind of I can't think of what the word will be, but she kind of la- like she doesn't really go in there with any game plan. It's like she kind of just goes with the flow. When she feels aggressive, she'll start turning up. But she needs to kind of go in there with the strategy that she's going to try to implement instead of just kind of going loosey goosey in there. But, um, you know, when she um, starts to get going, she'll walk into range without moving her head at times. But she kind of will use a lot of footwork, throw a lot of volume, forward pressure. Uh, we saw that against Justin Kish. She'll, she'll use a lot of feints, false starts, throw a large volume of punches, hooks, overhands, straight punches down the middle, uppercuts. And uh, she starts to catch people at the end of her punches and kind of snap their head back, kind of flashy strikes. 
And she's definitely going to be the superior puncher in this fight. She has to be aggressive, though, with her forward pressure to let her hands go. And if she puts combinations together and backs cast into the cage, she should have a huge advantage there. I mean, she may be even be able to get a knockout, but if she stands on the outside and lets Kasim get comfortable throwing kicks in the center, trading shots back and forth, I mean, that's how you make for a close fight. But Kim has the skills to make this an easy fight. She just has to go out there and do it. Kim doesn't really have power, though. She has no finishes with strikes in her career. She's also never been finished by strikes. She has a tough chin. Obviously, all these Asian fighters always have a lot of heart. And uh, she's coming off a loss of a very high-level striker in Antonina Shevchenko, where she went to decision there. But she had to have gotten some, you know, tricks from the way that she struck and some, you know, learning lessons there. For Jiyoung Kim, she's not a grappler. I don't really expect this fight to hit the mat. If anyone's to shoot or go for takedowns or the clinch, I expect it to be Nadia. For Kim, you know, she has zero UFC takedowns. And she was taken down two times against Shevchenko, but I don't really envision Kasim going for many takedowns. Kim does have three submissions pre-UFC, and she's never been submitted. And she has a big experience advantage here. And uh, she's definitely fought the higher level competition. And Kim's going to have to, you know, be able to get in the pocket, use her boxing, counter the kicks, and, uh, you know, use straight punches, make Kasim gun shy, and then start pressuring her. And, and if Kim can draw bad takedowns, that's where she could start counting with the uppercut or longer combinations. And, uh, you know, she has no knockouts, but maybe she could get a standing TKO or something. But she needs to keep the pressure high, make this a fast-paced fight. And Nadia Kasim, you know, she suffered the first loss of her career in February. She was submitted by Montana De La Rosa, and she largely got dominated in that match. But she's getting another fight here in her home country of Australia, and she's going to have the crowd on her side. And at 23, year old, 23 years old, it's conceivable she's going to be making some big improvements in between fights. And she's also implemented a strength and conditioning program for the first time in this camp, and she's taking it more serious. But prior to the UFC, Kasim fought some low-level fighters, but she got them all out of there quickly. You know, she finished her first three fights in under 30 seconds, and the other one was in uh, under a minute and 30 seconds. And on the feet, you know, Kasim is a kicker. Um, very questionable boxing, though. She tries to throw long punches almost to just keep girls off of her. Long one, two. She has a decent left hook, straight right hand combination, but she really just likes to stay on her bike, use lateral movement kicks stay on the outside you know inside outside leg kicks front and round kicks to the body and uh she throws a lot of round kicks question mark kicks to the head and she will throw some you know uh spinning back fist she has gotten a spinning back fist knockout she likes to throw a head kick to kind of spinning back or head kick to a spinning back fist combination and she can you know be a little bit you know she kind of tries to use antics out there in my opinion to steal rounds it's like She's not doing anything either, and it's kind of like she... I don't know if she does it, like, on purpose to seal the round, but she'll start throwing her hands up, posturing, and, um, you know, if nothing's going on, that's the most, you know, memorable part of a round. Maybe you'll give her the round for that. But defensively, you know, Katzen leaves a lot to be desired. Her footwork is not very good, and in her fight with Montana De La Rosa, Montana De La Rosa was able to easily cut her off, back her up against the cage, and when fighters get inside of her kicks, her chin is right in the air. She doesn't move her head. And fighters can land clean shots and just use that to set up takedowns. And she just backs up in straight lines. We saw De La Rosa, I mean, she put Casper on her back in less than 30 seconds in both rounds one and round two of her last fight. And Casper to me, you know, I just don't know if she's UFC level overall on the feet. She just needs a lot of work with her footwork, with her boxing. But she does have four KO TKOs in her first four fights. And none of the opponents she defeated, though, in those fights have a pro win. But Nadia Kasim, she's not a great wrestler. Off her back, uh, she isn't bad, though. She's long. She's an aggressive guard. She rolls for leg locks. Uh, she'll belly down into singles. Pretty good at trapping her wrist, throwing up triangles, arm bars. And she just uses her legs to offset balance, create scrambles, butterfly guard. And she's aggressive in her guard with elbows, punches. And uh, she was able to sweep uh, Alex Chambers a couple times. But Montana De La Rosa was able to pass her guard and uh, she keep a lot of top pressure on her. She was able to get the crucifix position, take him out. And then eventually she got a mounted triangle armbar. But Kasim is one of those girls. She's very scrambly in submissions. 
She has like almost like a rubbery arm. And she took top position when De La Rosa went for the armbar in round one, but ultimately was forced to submit to the armbar in round two. And uh, Kasim doesn't really let much offense off uh, in top position. She doesn't really have the best top control either. She has no submissions. And she also gasses badly. I mean, she has one round of cardio in her previous fights. And with her new strength and conditioning program that may be improved here, but it's never been shown in a fight. You know, she was huffing and puffing after round one in both of her UFC fights. For Jiang Kim, you know, she should have a significant striking advantage in this fight. If she is uh, aggressive and she's able to find her range early, counter the kicks, um, you know, I'm seeing her getting a TKO even maybe. I mean, Kasim's defense in the boxing range is just terrible, and Kim does put combinations together. And I just don't see many paths to victory for Kasim. If Kim uh, fights aggressive, if she stay, if she stays on the outside, I guess, and is low volume, if she makes it a fight where they're mirroring each other, she may lose like a split decision. Even then, I mean, I still think Kim would edge it. And I just don't think Nadi can get the takedowns. I don't think Nadi should be in the UFC. I mean, I think she could come back and be in there. She does have a uh, you know, good fighter's heart, in my opinion, but... You know, maybe go get some more fights on the regional scene and come back. But my pick's going to be Gian Kim here. I'm going to say a decision. And I'm actually, you know, fairly confident that she gets it done. <laughs> oh, man. Okay. Up next, you have Megan Anderson taking on uh, Zara Farn Dos Santos. And um, not super intrigued in this fight. But Megan Anderson, you know, she suffered that setback to uh, Felicia Spencer. And she's 1-2 and two so far in the UFC. And the hype that she came in with is kind of gone now and she definitely needs a big knockout to remind you know the fans of her performances in Invicta but Anderson you know she is fighting in Australia so she is going to get a big pop from the crowd probably be ready to go motivated but she's a big athletic fighter she's six feet tall decently you know moves decently well heavy-handed obviously good forward pressure good jab straight at hand and her, her right hand is accurate good overhand left as well and in close range she does you know, have fast hand speed, she'll throw punches in combination. She likes to mix in head kicks at the end of her combos. That's how she got the finish against Kat Zingano, even though that was because of a toe to the eye. But she will use, uh, you know, spinning back fists into straight punches to get into range. And she'll, you know, double, triple up on left or right hooks. And very aggressive, you know. She has really nice step in, knees, body head, good elbows against the cage. And on the feet, she's dangerous. I mean, she finishes a lot of girls... There's a lot of volume, and she doesn't let up until the fight's over. She's a has four um, her last four wins are via KO TKO, and she's never been finished by strikes. But um, obviously, her grappling has not been very good. She was taken down, submitted by Felicia Spencer very quickly, and she showed terrible defense when Spencer was on her back. I mean, it looks like she's not improved her ground game at all over the years. And uh, she can't get up off her back when she's taken down. And her takedown defense is just not very good. But in this fight, I don't see her having to defend takedowns. So it's a good matchup for her in that sense. If uh, she gets taken down by Dos Santos, who I've never seen attempt to take down in any of her fights, then, man, I mean, she's truly a lost cause. But Anderson's cardio hasn't been tested much in MMA. I mean, she's been out of round two four times. But she is just one and two in decisions. For Dos Santos, she's making her UFC debut here, and she has won three fights in a row, but she hasn't fought since December of 2017, and she's very tall, though. I mean, she's going to be having a longer reach than Megan Anderson, which I don't know if Megan's ever dealt with that before, but she's 5'10", Anderson is 6 feet, but she has a 73.5-inch reach to Anderson's 72-inch reach, but Dos Santos' striking overall is not very good. Uh, very plodding in her footwork. Just she tends to just try to walk from the town with straight combos. She does have a pretty good jab, but she doesn't use it nearly enough. And uh, she likes to, you know, get opponents backed into the cage, and that's where she'll, you know, throw more hooks, uppercuts, body kicks, and in the clinch, that's where she's definitely gets the most damage off on the feet. Good Muay Thai plum. She lands some decent knees, and uh, she also makes in some dirty boxing body head. But she doesn't move her head, and she stands very tall. Her chin is right in the air. But she's very tough. I mean, she looks like she has power. She could take a shot to give a shot. And sometimes it looks like she's just touching and not putting a lot of power in her punches. But then when she does actually sit down on her shots, these girls definitely feel it. And Zara's been able to walk down every opponent I've seen fight her, or I've seen her fight. 
And uh, she only fights in one way. I mean, that's moving forward. I have seen her crack coming into the range. I've seen her dropped and just continue to, you know, get back up and come forward like a cyborg. And her chin is definitely going to be tested here. She does have four knockouts and six wins. And she's not a grappler. I mean, this is going to be a stand-up fight. I don't see either fighter looking to get it to the ground. In the clinch, I would say Zara is better with her offensive weapons. But maybe Megan has better technique and is going to be able to control her. Uh, Dos Santos has no idea how to dig out in her hooks. And she can spend a large portions of rounds, you know, just stuck against the cage. And she hasn't fought many high-level wrestlers. But um, I imagine that if she does, she'd get taken down pretty easily. But she has shown that she can use her height to um, reverse position and get takedowns herself. And get top position. I mean, uh, but I don't expect that to happen in this fight. And Zara's no submissions. And I actually think a good prop for this fight, though, this fight doesn't go to the distance. Because I think these girls are going to, you know, stand on a napkin in the center of their cage and throw down. And I actually see this fight ending in the first round. I think Dos Santos is too hittable. And I expect Anderson to make her pay for that. Anderson has nice kicks. And Dos Santos is almost exclusively hands. Not quite as sharp or diverse. And both these girls have the chance to hurt each other. But Anderson has definitely fought better fighters, bigger, bigger promotions. She has her back against the wall here. She needs to win, and they obviously want her to win. They're giving her a striker that won't look to take her down, that hasn't fought in over a year. So, I mean, I'm going to go with Megan Anderson here, but laying the chalk on Megan Anderson at minus 500 is pretty crazy. I mean, don't do that. <laughs> Please don't do that. But, yeah, don't bet, on, don't bet on this fight, but I'm going with Megan Anderson. We have a great fight here up next with Brad Riddle taking on Jamie Malarkey. And uh, Brad Riddle is going to be a city kickboxing representative. And uh, he's 6-1 and one in his career. He's from New Zealand. He's fighting in Australian. So I expect him to be fighting against a hostile crowd here. And I think, that, I mean, I don't know for sure. Put it on the comments if you guys, you know, are going to have a good idea about this. But I think the Australians are going to be cheering against the New Zealanders in this uh, car. Just kind of due to, the, due to the beef with Rob and Izzy. But, uh... You know, I was only able to find a couple pro MMA fights from Riddell, so it's hard to 100% get a read on him. But uh, Brad Riddell, he's a great kickboxer. He's won several national championships. He's fought very, I mean, he's high level. He's fought high level guys. You know, Cedric uh, Dumbia, who's, you know, arguably the number one guy in the world right now. John Wayne Parr, he's actually defeated John Wayne Parr. So, I mean, he's faced the elite of the elite in the striking realm. And he's very tactical. I mean, excellent fates, very good forward pressure, and he just backs opponents near the cage or the ropes. I've actually never seen a fight in a cage, even in his MMA fight. His MMA fights that I watched, it was in a ring. But Riddle has a great jab. He's a heavy inside-outside leg kick, and he has a nasty left hook. I mean, he'll throw the left hook to the body, to the head very well. Nasty left hook, right uppercut. And a very good uh, overhand right, very heavy. You can knock fighters out with that with one shot. His pull counter straight right hand or right hook is excellent as well. And his hand speed is just very fast. And if he can land a pull counter, he's usually going to come back with three, four more punches behind it. And he likes to fight, um, you know, very close quarters. You know, he isn't a guy that uses a ton of movement, forehead to forehead. I feel, you know, he has to move and angle a bit more in MMA than he did in kickboxing. But he does have hard round kicks to the body, to the head, nasty front knees, very explosive. And he almost low punches to sleep with his feints, kind of, you know, shuffling in a range. And then he explodes and, uh, you know, he's showing the ability to create new angles with sidesteps in the pocket. He'll land in combination, sidestep as you try to exit, land clean shots. And this is usually where he gets his knockouts with his hands. In MMA, his feints are going to be extremely high level. I mean, I see him freezing a lot of opponents with those. And uh, Riddle has five knockouts in MMA. And uh, won his first decision in his last fight. He does have a knockout win over uh, Keenan Song, who's in the UFC. Other than that, he's not fought very high level competition. And, you know, in the fight with... Uh, who what? I can't remember, but in a fight that I saw on YouTube, his recent fight, he did defend a single leg takedown. Uh, he reversed, he circled to the back, and his opponent was able to regard it, and Riddell stood up really quickly. But, um, you know, Riddell does do a good job of using feints to draw takedown attempts, 
And this allows him to get his opponents tired, discouraged to continue to shoot. And he's obviously not going to want to be on his back here. Um, I don't think he's even going to be want to be inside an opponent's guard. Riddle's one loss was a guard pool armbar. And uh, I haven't seen him off his back really in MMA. But uh, Riddle's going to be looking to keep this fight on the feet, keep it standing. I do feel with Riddle's style, he may struggle with grapplers, though. He likes to fight in close range, and opponents are going to be able to shoot in, grab a hold of him there. And this can be the fourth fight of Riddle for 2019, so he's been very active. I don't expect Riddle to be overwhelmed by the moment. I see him performing to his capabilities here. I mean, he's fought in some big stages in uh, kickboxing and Muay Thai. And, um, you know, I think he's going to be, you know, ready to go here. For Jamie Malarkey, I mean, he called out um, Brad Riddle, so he wants this fight. And he's the more experienced fighter. He's 11-2, and two, and he's finished four consecutive fights. He has spent um, the, a lot of his fights, the majority of his career at 145, but he has had his last three at lightweight. And uh, Brad Riddle has fought at 170, so there could be a size discrepancy here. You got to look at that on the face-offs, and that may, you know, change my pick here. But we're going to be able to figure that out as the fight goes, fight week goes on. But um, Malarkey's striking looks fairly technical. He has a nice jab, very good one-two. He doubles up on the jab, very uh, nice left hook, good left hook straight right hand. Nice jab right hook, he'll dig to the body. Really nice leg kicks, he'll throw a jab to a body or head kick combo. And his hand combinations aren't bad, man. When opponents allow him to go first or get his range, uh, you know, he'll really just start to pop with the jab, then come over the, come back with some big hooks, big shots, puts combos together fluidly. And Malarkey doesn't have quick feet, and due to that, fighters who can get inside on him, um, make him, you know, back up at straight lines. He's a little bit hittable in close range. But he did show some improvements in that aspect. He is getting better at slipping punches, better head movement, uh, countering back to back opponents off, countering with uppercuts. And he's willing to trade. I mean, I would say his striking looked the best it ever had and ever has in his last match. And he's definitely improving his boxing. And uh, Malarkey also has great forward pressure. He keeps the volume high. Definitely has pop in his punches. He has been knocked out one time by Alexander Volkanovsky. And um, he also lost by uh, TKO due to shots on the mat one time. But Malarkey has seven knockouts and he's finished three wins in a row in that manner. And um, Jamie Malarkey is going to be looking to mix it up. I mean, he isn't a bad wrestler. When fighters pressure him, he starts to back him. He, uh, in, or when fighters pressure him and back him up, that's when he tends to shoot. He has good double legs, good body locks. Against the cage, he has good double legs as well. He's relentless going for the takedown there. And uh, he gets in on single legs very well. And Malarkey can be too aggressive going for the takedown at times. He can end up on his back. He can even uh, give his back going for takedowns. And uh, when Malarkey's in top position, though, he's very good. He, he'll posture up. He lands big elbows, big hammer fists. And, um, you know, he'll move to half half guard. He'll look to uh, trap trap an arm with his knee, land undefended shots. And his ground and pound in half guard is very, very, very heavy. He can finish fights there, good control. And he'll look to move to the mount at the back. But he can kind of be a little bit sloppy in those positions. And uh, end up on bottom. And he can also, doesn't really have the best uh, finishing ability with the chokes. But off his back, you know, I would say that's his weakest spot. In his last loss that he had, he was finished with ground and pound elbows. He does have a few submissions, but he's more of a ground and pound guy. He has four submissions. He has never been submitted. And he's finished all, all but one of his wins. And has been finished in both of his losses. So he's a killer be killed guy. Um, he has great cardio and... Um, you know, he's going to be there to fight for sure. And I think Jamie Malarkey is going to be able to mix it up, get the victory here. But not confident at all. Um, I think Riddle could definitely catch him with a big hook or overhand or get inside early and knock him out in round one. But I just think that Malarkey is a striking to stay long range if he can start to faint takedowns maybe. And uh, if he could get takedowns, get top control, I could see him maybe getting a submission, maybe pounding him out. And I think Riddle can be good, but he needs a little bit more polishing. He has seven fights, poor competition, and I think Malarkey is a little bit more well-rounded. And I'm going to say he gets a third-round finish on the ground here, but it could go either way. And I'm going to, you know, look at these guys during fight week, and I may change my pick on this one. So, you know, come back and look in the description, see if I change my pick. But my pick's going to be Jamie Malarkey early via third-round TKO or submission on the ground. 
And uh, up next year we have a 170 pound fight with uh, Maki Pitolo taking on Kyle and Potter. And uh, Pitolo is getting a quick turnaround after he had that impressive win on the Dana, Dana White Tender Series. He moved up a weight class for that fight. He was at 185 pounds and he was still able to knock out his opponent. And Pitolo is coming back down to 170 for this fight, taking on a former lightweight in Kyle and Potter. And um, in Victory FC, they show your weight, like the uh, weight that you weigh in at, at fight night. Pitolo's weighing in 191 versus Dakota Cochran a few years ago, so he's a huge guy for the weight class, so he should have a big size advantage here. And he can be the much faster, more technical striker, better footwork, more fluid with his movement, better fakes and feints, better in and out movement, nasty jab, great one too, really nice inside outside leg kicks. Really good jab to the body, good left hook. And he's good at touching opponents with the jab and then, uh, you know, creating openings for short hooks, mixing in power shots. And uh, sometimes fighters can land hooks or overhands to counter his jab. And uh, he can get clipped and uh, forced to move backwards. But when he can get his combinations going with the, with the jab, you get the long combos. You know, he's excellent at using good shot selection. He'll attack the body, uppercut hooks, overhands. Uh, and he finished Justin Sumter with a big 185 with brutal body shots. He'll even mix in spinning back fists, flying knees, elbows. And Patola's ability to put combinations together with his hands should do him very well here. If Patola just touches pot as he tries to get inside, the big shots will come. And Patolo can get hurt. He doesn't have a great chin. And he can be a little bit reckless at times. And slows down later in fights. In the fights, he's been stunned. You know, he's been fighting much bigger men, so I don't see Potter being able to hurt Pitolo with a punch unless it's right on the button. The only way I could see Potter really knocking him out is with the head kick. Pitolo has been KO'd twice, though, and he does have five KO tickets himself. And Pitolo wasn't a bad wrestler, and he looks to mix it up. In this fight, I would look to just use the wrestling in reverse, keep it on the feet. But Pitolo does uh, use his longer combos to back opponents up, where... He'll shoot some good singles, double legs, nice reactive shots at range. And in top position, he's really a back taker. He won't really throw much ground and pound, but he looks to pass aggressively and uh, just look for the back. And he has solid control. He'll attack with rear naked chokes. He does have two rear naked choke victories. And um, in his fight with Dakota Cochran, though, he was shucked off the back and got guillotined in a scramble. In this fight with Potter, you know, it was tricky on the ground. I wouldn't mess around on the ground at all. If, pa if Patola could just keep it on the feet at range, you should have a big advantage. And Patola has three submissions. He has been submitted twice. And he's going to be the much bigger fighter in this matchup, like I said. And, uh, you know, he can't get tired in a high-paced fight. So for this fight, he just needs to be composed. Piece Potter up as he tries to come forward. And put his hand combinations together. And Potter likes to come forward defending punches with his face. So Patola could keep this a striking fight. I think it's only a matter of time before he finds the knockout. For Colin Potter, he's looking to make good on his second UFC fight. He had a bad UFC debut where he was knocked out badly in February. And uh, he's fighting in Australia. He's training alongside guys like Ben Soli, Jake Matthews. And he's an older guy. He's 35 years old. So a win is absolutely crucial here. And Potter's striking is just not very good. He doesn't have great footwork. He'll just plot into range. He doesn't cut the cage off well. He throws some big left hooks, overhand rights, loopers. He does have a powerful uppercut, and he'll throw a jab, head kick, and most of his knockouts are via head kick, decent low kicks, and he'll duck his head, though. He eats a lot of punches, and he just tries to return, and he stands right in front of opponents. He isn't very fast. He just likes to use a high guard to defend punches, but he has a leaky guard. He can be hit to the body, and uh, he'll just sit there and eat combinations, He's very tough, but in his UFC debut, he had a brutal combination that was followed up with ground and pound that knocked him out cold. And Potter style is reckless. I mean, due to that, he's been knocked out four times. And he just doesn't have the big one-punch power. But he does have five knockouts. And like I said, he has that dangerous head kick. But uh, Callum Potter, you know, he's always looking to get the fight to the mat. That's his game. He's a black belt in jiu-jitsu. Very good in top position. He doesn't shoot many takedowns from range. But he likes to get the over under hooks in the clinch. He'll use uh, hook to disguise singles, doubles. And he has pretty quick shots. He doesn't really have the ability to drive through on many takedowns, though. He'll close the distance, then push opponents to the cage, look for trips, body locks. And he has some nice hip throws. But overall, I would say Potter is not the greatest wrestler. 
And Potter will pull guard. He uses leg locks, omoplatas to reverse the top position. He will also jump on guillotines, triangles, arm bars. And when he does get top position, that's his game. He's very good. He has heavy ground and pound, nice elbows, passes the dominant positions quickly. He's aggressive. Uh, he has uh, really nice runic chokes. He has 10 submissions. And he has been submitted four times. And in his career, Potter has shown poor cardio. He really slows down in the third round. He will try to fight through the fatigue, but he becomes very hittable. And in this fight, man, he needs to go for broke. He needs to be aggressive, never go backwards. He has to get in the clinch, slow the fight down, look for takedowns, even pull guard. At range on the feet, he's most likely going to be at a huge disadvantage. He needs to get this fight to the ground and try to catch Pitolo in a submission. But you have to go with Maki Pitolo here. The UFC is obviously trying to get him a win. Potter's a former 155er. He's way slower. And his stand-up is just not up to par. He was brutally knocked out in a minute by Jalen Turner, who's 1-2 and two in the UFC. And Potter is going to wars on the regional scene with 13-9 and nine guys, being severely outstruck. And Potter needs Patola to make a mistake, you know, dive into a guillotine, wrestle, get swept and submitted. Other than that, Patola should knock him out in round one. I mean, the skill level, the speed, the size, athleticism on the feet is far and away in Patola's favor. And I will say, first round kill for Patola, I could see him finishing Potter with body shots. And uh, fairly confident, or actually very confident, in Patola to get it done here. You know, next year we have a fight with Jake Matthews taking on Ross Team Achman. And Jake Matthews is going to be looking to bounce back from that loss to Rocco Martin last year. This is going to be his first fight of 2019. He's getting another home game here in Australia. And he's looking to take on another fighter who's looking for his first UFC win in Akman. And Matthews, he's very light on his feet. He's fast. He's explosive. He likes to bounce on the outside, then explode in with big overhands, hooks, uppercuts. He closes his distance with nice straight punches. And when opponents try to come in on him, you'll counter with big flurries, overhand heaters. And Matthews definitely has big power. He can sit opponents down with either hand. Uh, he likes to throw the overhand right left hook combination. And even if he does, doesn't land the overhand right, he'll still follow through with the left hook. And he catches a lot of guys backing up with that. And Matthews um, can get very wild and wide in the pocket as the fight goes on. And the fighter's pressure, I mean, it gets him very uncomfortable. And he kind of just wings punches to get people to back off but he showed some good head movement and uh in some fights he really comes up shows up ready to go like in his fight with uh ying jing liang he was eating punches and returning but fighters who are able to faint or stay calm and block and return or definitely get to have success in the stand-up versus matthews matthews doesn't throw a lot of kicks but he does throw some leg kicks in his last fight though he actually got eight up with low calf kicks so Maybe he should learn something from that and throw some of his own more. But Matthews will throw some nice flying knees, and he definitely has a strong chin. I mean, he's willing to take shots to give shots. It's funny because, like I said, in some fights he's ready for wars. In other fights, it seems like he he breaks a little bit. And he hasn't really quite mastered his mental game. But Matthews definitely is explosive. He has four knockouts, and he's only been finished by TKO one time. And that was on the ground against Kevin Lee. And Ju Matthews is a jiu-jitsu black belt. He's a smashing top game. Very strong in the clinch. Hard punches. Hard knees to the body. Looks for really nice trips. Body locks. Good double legs. He does a good job of grabbing the single leg. And then coming back up uh, into a body lock. Dumping his opponent. Blends his takedowns uh, and striking very well in some fights. And then other fights he doesn't do as well. But when Matthews gets top position, he has tremendous cardio. Ground and pound. He'll posture up, land some brutal punches, elbows, and uh, he's always searching for the back. He's an excellent rear naked choke. His last win was by rear naked choke, and he most likely would have gotten a guillotine versus the leech if it wasn't for an egregious eye gouge. And Matthews will snatch guillotines very quickly. He's a great squeeze, and he's had some fights where he's broken with uh, wrestling scrambles, like versus Andrew Holbrook, but uh, that was 155 pounds. And I think that he's much better suited for 170. Uh, Matthews was hurt with the shot in his last fight. Panic wrestled and then was put to sleep with the Anaconda choke. But he's facing another black belt in Rocco Martin. And I don't see Akman having the jiu-jitsu to submit Matthews. But Matthews has been submitted twice in his career. He has seven submissions of his own. And he can be a front runner. I mean, if he gets off to a hot start, he gets confident. He's usually going to finish or dominate you. But if he has to face adversity, you know, he's shown some quit in the past. But Rostam Akhman, he's getting a quick turnaround. 
He had that debut loss to uh, the Russian guy, but he's still very young. He's just six and one, and his UFC debut. I mean, that's his only pro fight available online. And in this fight, you know, Akman he implemented a forward pressure strike striking style, but I just wasn't really impressed. He was he was able to cut the cage off pretty well, but he didn't let many shots go, and uh, his opponent was able to land an angle off. He does have a good one too. He'll double jab one two. He'll try to use his jab to set up longer hook combinations. Uh, good overhand right left hook. But overall, he's pretty low volume. He doesn't kick much at all. He will throw some occasional leg kicks, but rarely. And he does have a good chin. He was able to eat some shots in return versus Candasco, But he was dropped in the second round. He's very hittable. Doesn't use a lot of footwork. I feel Akman's also very susceptible to leg kicks. And he's just not the fastest guy or most explosive, so he could struggle to find his range on the feet. And he definitely has good cardio. He'll continue to walk fighters down. He was able to, you know, tire out Kandasco with that and win round three in their matchup. But he doesn't look to have huge power. He does have five kill TKOs, and he's never been finished by strikes. He has a good chin, but he really has only had seven fights, and he hasn't fought the greatest guys. But Akbon looks to be a better grappler than striker. He likes to cut fighters off, back them up, and then clinch up with them against a cage. He looks to dig double unhooks, get trips or body locks. And his wrestling doesn't look extremely high level, but he's dogged. He'll use the clinch to lean on opponents, ride them out, get the tight waist, uh, you know, circle to the back. Um, you know, continue to just take them down, mat return when they try to get up. And on top, against Kandasco, he was never really able to establish top position. Kandasco was able to reverse some of his takedown attempts against the cage as well, but very briefly. And Akman works very quickly off his back. I noticed that. He scrambles well. He loves to attack the legs. And um, in this fight, I see Matthews as the better wrestler and jiu-jitsu player, though. If Akman is able to outgrapple Matthews, that would be a significant uh, accomplishment. And I feel like Matthews would have to have an injury or an adrenaline dump or break or something. But Akman has great cardio, and he's going to try to push the pace. I mean, he does have two finishes on the ground, one heel hook, one ground and pound finish. And he's finished all six of his wins, but definitely needs to bounce back from his first loss as a professional here. In this fight, I expect Akman to come out hot, try to control the center early. I see him trying to get in on the clinch against the fence, put Matthews on his back. And I think Matthews is going to get confident and comfortable with the speed of Akron very quickly, though. I think that he's going to see he's much faster. And as long as he just moves, he's going to be able to land clean and not get hit. And if Akron pressures too heavy, just get takedowns. And I see Matthews being the better wrestler, being able to put him on his back. And I'm intrigued to see how Akron deals with the physicality of the top game of Matthews. If he's able to scramble uh on bottom against him or submit him off his back that'd be very impressive if he's able to get up and just gas him out through that that could be a way to beat him but um i think that matthew's gonna be the much faster guy um i think that when he counters him he hits hard he's gonna get him gun shy and at that point i see akman solely trying to get in the clinch get takedowns make it ugly and i think when that happens i think matthew's gonna reverse him get top position and uh finish with the submission or get a tko on the ground um, you know, I think he can even knock him out on the feet. And if he was to lose this fight, that would be an awful loss. I mean, he can't afford to drop back-to-back -back fights, especially against a guy the caliber of Akman. So I got Matthews all day here, and I think he definitely needs to get the win and probably needs to get the finish here. And uh, up next, we have a heavyweight fight with Jorgen DeCastro taking on Justin Taffa. And uh, this is an interesting fight. It should be fun to watch. I mean, Jorgen Castro, he earned his contract with a knockout win on the Dana White Contender Series earlier this year. And he was one of the biggest underdogs of the season, but he came through with the victory. And uh, at only 5-0, and we're really going to see if he's truly ready to fight in the UFC. But for the first fight, his opponent's actually only 3-0. and So, you know, he's actually going to have more experience than his, uh, you know, opponent here. But DeCastro, he's a kickboxer, a really nasty leg kick to throw him early and often. That's how he finished his last fight. He could sometimes go to the well even too much with the leg kicks and uh, kind of just stand in front of a punch with a high guard, doesn't set him up and get hit. But fighters can, um, you know, clinch up or count him with body shots or through the middle of his leaky guard when he has the high guard. But um, he does have a really nice leg kick overhand right or right hook combination. And I do believe he's the faster fighter here, both with his hands and his footwork. And he likes to close the distance with wide punches, trade shots in the pocket. 
He likes to jump in a range with a straight right hand. And if he lands it, he'll double up on it. And I feel in this fight, DeCastro should try to stay on the outside. Use his movement, his kicks. And he was throwing a really nasty flying knee to counter his last one, his takedowns and forward pressure. And, um, you know, he's definitely hittable if you can cut him off. But, um, you know, I don't think he has as much power as Tafa. And doesn't look as big, so he needs to avoid brawling. But if he can implement his style on the feet of moving, kicking, then, uh, you know, countering when his opponents come in with the hooks, um, he should be successful. And he has finished three of his four wins by KOTKO. And he isn't looking to take fights to the ground. Uh, DeCastro will push fighters against the cage in the clinch at times. In his last fight, you know, he's able to defend and deny a majority of, of former college wrestlers' takedowns. And he bounced right back to his feet. And he used his ability to defend takedowns to tire his opponent out, ultimately finish him. In this fight, I don't expect him to have to defend very many takedowns. Uh, I expect this fight to take place on the feet. And DeCastro is a smaller heavyweight. He looks to have decent cardio. He does move a lot, and if opponent could cut him off, keep the pressure, it could tire him out. But I think that if it gets to the later rounds, he's going to be the guy moving better, uh, a little bit quicker, faster probably. But Justin Toffa, he's getting an opportunity to fight in the UFC at just 3-0. He does have three knockouts. And, um, you know, he's a training partner to Ivasa, Mark Hunt. And that's probably why he got the opportunity here. And he's also a southpaw. On the feed, he's a brawler, man. He has a decent straight overhand left. And if he lands a left hand, it's almost like a range finder to come in with hook combinations. He'll try to back opponents up, force opponents to trade powerful hooks. And he'll throw really nice uppercuts, really nasty right hooks to the body. He finishes his last opponent with a right hook to the body. And uh, he really has a nice body and head kick. He has a good left hook. And his last two fights have both lasted under 30 seconds. Um... He's not very fast, though. In his debut, he struggled with the speed, the movement of his opponent, so he did a lot of grappling. And uh, Ta has finished all three of his wins by knockout, but he showed off some grappling in his MMA debut, like I said. In his last two matches, there's been no grappling at all, but he did land a sloppy single leg takedown. He's shown some clinch takedowns, and he used the clinch takedowns to land directly in side control, take the mount, but sloppy mount control, and he doesn't look like a very good scrambler. But when he does have the fight in top position, he will rain down shots, try to finish the fight. He finished his debut with ground and pound from the mount. But I just think he has sloppy top control overall. He did get swept in that fight several times and uh, was mounted. And he's good at moving off his back. You know, he's explosive. He'll get the unhook and uh, get back to his feet. But if he's taken down by a good wrestler, I feel he's going to get smashed most likely. I mean, he's not going to have to deal with that in this fight. But top five's... Cardio held up into the second round in that fight with a lot of wrestling. Um, that's the only thing we've seen from his cardio. In this fight, if anything, if anyone goes for takedowns, I do think it's going to be Tafa. But I'm going to pick DeCastro here. I think as long as he uses his movement, doesn't stand in front of Tafa, he should win the stand-up. You know, uh, use his movement, chop the legs, uh, deny the takedowns. And when Tafa tries to get inside, land, angle off, and um, I don't see him taking down and holding down DeCastro. I mean, we saw DeCastro defend against a better wrestler in his last performance. This is low-level heavyweight, so I mean, anything can happen. But I'm going to DeCastro via second-round TKO. I think he's going to chop the legs, get Tafa desperate, then put him down as he comes in aggressively. So I'm going with Jorgen DeCastro here to get his victory in his UFC debut. And uh, I'm next year with a very close fight with Diego Lima taking on Luke Jumo. And Diego Lima, he looks to be maybe turning the corner. I mean, the once-touted prospect who flamed out of the UFC almost twice has now won two in a row, and he's once again entrenched as a favorite in this spot, you know. And could honestly ask for a top-15 opponent with three consecutive victories. And Diego Lima, he's implemented a counter strategy in his last two fights. In this fight, I see him doing the same thing. And his reach really pays dividends for him. He uses a lot of ladder movement, jabs, long punches, very powerful one-two, nice uppercut left hook combination. And when opponents close the distance, Lima will throw concussive counter hooks. I mean, big power, really nas nasty counter left hook. We saw him knock out Chad Lepree with that. And his left hook straight right hand is probably the most powerful combination for him. Lima will also attack the body with jabs, with hooks. He doesn't uh, control the center well, and I expect him to do a lot of backing up in this fight as well. And uh, Lima can do... Uh, a lot of waiting for his opponents and let them get off with strikes without coming back. He definitely isn't winning the volume battle in most fights, 
But he does have four knockouts. He has pretty solid power. His chin is questionable. He has been finished four times by strikes. But Diego Lima's wrestling looked the best it ever had defensively in his last fight. In this fight, I don't expect Diego Lima to really have to defend as many takedowns. But against Court McGee, who's a grinder, a good wrestler, Lima's able to defend all his shots, even take McGee down against the fence. And I would be surprised if Jumo took him down. But Lima, he has pretty good takedowns against the cage himself. And if anyone's good takedowns, I see it being Lima. Lima's good at getting the tight weight, circling to the back, getting suplexes. And he's a brown butt in jiu-jitsu. He's going to have the better brown, better ground game. And he also has six submissions. But a lot of those were early in his career. In this fight, I actually do expect it to play out on the feet. I see Lima only grappling if he's struggling with the striking of Jumo. Jumo leaves his chin high. And if Lima can land a clean shot, we saw how he put Laprise out cold. And uh, Lima has struggled with wrestlers in UFC career, but he's not going to have to worry about that much here. And he's going to do what he does. I mean, try to counter Jumo, catch him clean, and knock him out. Um, and, uh, you know, keep Jumo on the outside, out volume him. But Lima has to catch uh, Jumo early with power shots to make him lower the volume and the forward pressure. And uh, if he catches him clean, he could always knock him out. And he should be the sharper fighter as he's more busier. And uh, Luke Jumo, he's returning from a long layoff. He hasn't fought since February 2018, where he earned that victory over Daiche Abe. And Jumo was scheduled to fight Jeff Neal in December, but he had to pull out due to a handbrake. And he's another New Zealander, so I'm not really sure if the crowd's going to be pro or negative towards him. But he's a Taekwondo practitioner, uses a wide stance, but not much movement. He prefers to walk opponents down, use his eyes to stay in their face and pull counter. And he does uh, slide in and out of range very quickly, though. He's explosive, and he's fluid with his punches. He doesn't have a lot of fat on them. And when he goes first, he has a very nice jab, good one-two. He'll double jab himself into range for a powerful straight right hand. He looks for counter uppercuts, and he's a very nice left hook both to the head and body. But his money shot is definitely the straight right hand. He pulled counters with it well. He walks fighters into it. Uh, very nice round, round and front kicks to the body. He will also go to the head with those techniques. And Jumo does leave his chin high though. And he can also overextend on his punches and get off balance, give his back even at times. When he got hit versus Daiche Abe, he got very emotional, tried to throw some big shots, overextended, and got rocked even more. And he's very tough though. He's willing to stick in the pocket and trade. Against Diego Lima, that could get him knocked out. I mean... But it could get uh, Jumo a knockout as well. You know, Lima has been finished a few times by strikes. Jumo, you know, he's shown much more durability. He's never been knocked out. And he does have four TKOs himself. But uh, Luke Jumo, you know, his grappling has been exposed a little bit in the UFC. His flat-footedness allows fighters to clinch up with him, get in on his legs. And he does have good takedown defense against the cage. He has good balance, heavy hips, digs underhooks well. But he struggles to get his back off the cage. And uh, he's also decent at seeing shots coming from range, bringing his hips back, sprawling. But when fighters can set them up with punches or just drive through explosively, uh, he can get taken out pretty easily. Shinzo Anzai was able to put him on his back with a double leg in the second round. And off his back, Luke Jumo doesn't do anything. He just lays flat on his back, uh, tries to control posture, but he has no idea how to stand up. And against Abe, Jumo did look to mix it up, and he landed a couple single legs, but didn't look very technical and he couldn't control position on the ground. Um, Jamal does have four submissions and he has been submitted twice. He definitely has good cardio. He pushes the pace. In this fight, Jamal needs to be more active. I would throw leg kicks, use jabs, fast punches, but stay busy. If he keeps a lot of uh, volume in Lima's face, the big shots will come where he could possibly get the knockout. And this is a very close fight for me to call. I mean, I feel it should be a pick em. I think on the feet, uh, Jumo's going to out volume him and Lima need, needs to get the knockout. If Lima can get takedowns, I think that's going to change the whole fight and get him the victory. And Lima's been training with high level guys, training partners like Rocco Martin, who I feel is a cr- close proximity to Jumo on the feet, especially. And I'm going to pick Lima by decision, but I think it's dog or pass here. So I think the value's on Luke Jumo, but I'm going to pick Diego Lima more due to his training partners, his. Uh, peaking right now and he's being more active so uh i'm going with uh, diego lima to get the win here <laughs> man talk about a setup fight here i'm not going to spend a lot of time on this one um you know i'm s- even though tai tui voss should definitely win this fight i'm still not extremely confident 
You know, you can never be super confident in this guy, especially because Spivak does have some, you know, submissions on the ground. But, man, I mean, Spivak's debut was just embarrassing. He felt the power of Walt Harris and just quit. And, um, you know, you know who else has a lot of power? Uh, Tai Tuivasa. And Tai Tuivasa showed a lot of heart in his last fight. He went three rounds but with Blagoy Vanoff. And uh, he's a tough dude. Uh, he has the ability to take a shot. He has the ability to land a big shot. And in this fight, you know, I just feel like Spivak, he can't fight on the outside with Tuivasa. Tuivasa gets a chop and down with kicks. He's too fast. He's too technical with his kickboxing. So Spivak has to get inside, has to start going for takedowns. And I think when he gets inside, he's going to be the much smaller guy for one. I think that he's going to be met. You know, Tuivasa inside, that's where he lands his big knees, his big elbows. And I think we're going to see a dominant or, you know, really, really nice knockout by Tai Tuivasa here in the first round. It's going to be like a flying knee, an elbow in the clinch, something big and close range. And I think he's going to take him out. So, um, yeah, I mean, that's really all I have to say for this matchup. I don't really want to talk about Sergey Spivak after his debut against Walt Harris. So I'm going to take Tai Tuivasa to... Get it done there like the uh, UFC wants him to. So I'm going to go with Tai Tuivasa to get the win at home. And I'm next year with the co-main event. This is a great fight. Uh, kind of contrast of styles. But it should be a fun matchup with Ally Kinta taking on Dan Hooker. And um, in this fight, you know, you're going to see Ally Kinta being the hunter. Dan Hooker trying to be the sharpshooter. The guy moving backwards. And Dan Hooker is dangerous, man. I mean, we've seen that in his fights where I feel like... I like Quinta loads up a lot, like we saw with Gilbert Burns, where uh, Dan Hooker was able to land those straight shots down the middle real clean, and uh, those nice knees down the middle. I mean, Dan Hooker is very straight, while I like Quinta throws a lot of overhands. But the thing is, Hooker does have that tall man's defense, and he gets hit a lot. So I like Quinta. What he has to do is he has to go forward, throw in combination. I mean, he has to let his hands go through hard hooks. Uh, throw more than one and if he can you know land two three shots in a row on hooker I mean hooker has a great chin but I like Kinta hits really hard and if he can land you know a combination clean he could knock him out for sure I think I Kinta has to always go forward he cannot let hooker keep the range and he has to be ready and in shape to throw a large volume of punches I mean just keep the pressure keep the pace like Jason Knight did go for takedowns and he actually has to commit to these takedowns. I Quinta does a lot of takedowns where he's half-hearted on the committal. And then, uh, you know, comes back with shots, which is good as well. He should do that in this fight. But, you know, I think he has to get Dan Hooker on his back in this fight. And, uh, you know, spend portions on the, on the ground or at least put him on his back so Hooker knows that he can't be so free with his kicks, with his knees. But the thing is, man, Dan Hooker has that nasty guillotine he wraps up that he could submit I Quinta with. And, um, you know, we've seen Hooker be able to scramble back up to his feet very quickly. He denied the takedown attempts at Gilbert Burns with that guillotine, which, I mean, Burns is a high-level jiu-jitsu black belt. He submitted Mark Giacchese with the guillotine. And Dan Hooker, I mean, he's just a sniper, man. Nasty knees up the middle. He can be a little bit square at times, and he can definitely give up the leg kicks, which I think Aikita needs to attack with. But he also throws really nice low calf kicks and... I just think the difference in this fight is Al isn't a super active wrestler in terms of getting into the ground. So, like I said, he needs to go forward. He cannot allow Dan Hooker any space. But I think Dan Hooker's distance control is very good. He's going to have a very long reach advantage. He throws a lot of straight shots up the middle. Like I said, front kicks, front knees, straight punches, jabs. Uh, and I think that it's going to keep I Quinta on the outside, keep him off balance. I think for Al to win, he needs that first round knockout, really. I think that he needs to get in there, um, you know, land a long combo, catch Dan Hooker cold, knock him out. But Dan Hooker has a sick chin, man. I mean, a great chin. He, he absorbs a lot of shots, but he gives shots back. And that dude has a really a lot of power himself. And um, I just think that when Al Iquinta loads up, that Dan Hooker is going to be catching him with the tighter straighter shots and the shots you don't see are the shots that hurt you so i think that i quinta could level change onto his onto a knee as well or an uppercut but overall i just think that the striking advantage is on the side of dan hooker dan hooker has been training with 
Israel Adesanya for this fight at City Kickboxing. All those guys are killers over there. And, um, you know, he should be ready to go. He should be pumped. Huge opportunity for him in a co-main event. I mean, he's fighting a guy in Ally Kenta who has a lot of name value. So he could take all his hype here with the victory. And, um, you know, Al's a very tough guy. But we did see him get pieced up, hurt very badly by Don Cerrone five months ago. And eventually that chin's going to crack. I don't know if it's going to be this fight. Um, but, you know, I do think Ally Quinta is live in terms of uh, he, has, he does have that chance to get a knockout. And if he comes in shape and he throws a large volume of punches, always keeps Hooker on the back foot, can get some takedowns, can control the center, can control the distance, he has a chance to win the fight. But overall, I just think that it's going to be Hooker controlling the distance. It's going to be Hooker controlling the, um, you know, the center of the octagon eventually once Ally Quinta starts to take more damage. I think that his kicks are going to be a difference. And I think that I Quinta could get knocked out in this spot. So I'm going to go with Dan Hooker via third round TKO in this in this fight. And uh, I think that he's going to have a very good performance and uh, really show out here. And, um, you know, bring his name to a higher plateau. Here we go, the main event. This is a you know an amazing fight, man. Robert Whitaker taking on Israel Adesanya for the undisputed belt. You know Israel Adesanya has the interim title. Rob has the real title, and uh, he's getting the opportunity to defend at home, Whitaker. And uh, you know he had one of the best fights of his uh, of uh, or best fights in middleweight championship history against um, Uar Romero's last time out. But he has been out over a year, almost a year and a half now. So. I mean, he could come in here with a little bit of ring rust. But Robert and Izzy, they've been going back and forth this whole lead up. I expect the crowd to be very pro Whitaker. And, um, you know, you know, it's been 15 months since his last fight, though. So he's had illnesses, injuries, and he's really slowed down, uh, you know, his progression in recent years. But he's still only 28 years old. And um, Israel Adesanya, he's going to be looking to unify the belts, become the undisputed world champion. And Adesanya, he's had the astronomical rise up the rankings. I mean, he captured the UFC title in less than two years. And if he can get the nod here in this fight, you know, that would be incredible. And Adesanya had one of the best fights of the year as well against Kelvin Gastelum. And he's fought four times since Whitaker previously fought. So he's been much more active. In this fight, you know, Whitaker's going to have to get inside, use punching combinations. I don't see the oblique kicks, the front kicks working very well. He's at an 8-inch reach disadvantage, and if he wants to play a range kicking game with Izzy, you know, I see Izzy landing the clicks, landing the kicks, and Rob coming up short. I see Adesanya sitting on the outside, at his distance, trying to control it with his feints, his counters, and Whitaker has to be able to control the center, back Izzy up, make him skirt the cage. I think Whitaker needs to attack the body with kicks with straight punches when he backs Izzy up, uses jab to start punching combinations. He should try to feint, force Adesanya to go first, where he can counter with an elbow or his left hook in close range. And I think in close range, Whitaker is going to have an advantage. He throws, you know, tighter shots because he's the shorter guy. And uh, he tucks his chin while he could slip and rip. And I feel he's maybe more dangerous with one shot with his hands. But I see Israel as the more fluid pinpoint striker with the better defense. And the problem with that is I just don't know if Whitaker is going to be able to get inside without taking shots. Adesanya is excellent footwork. He circles off the cage very well. And I see Adesanya definitely winning the striking overall. I think he's going to be able to use his straight punches, his hooks to catch uh, Rob coming in. I think his snap kicks, his round kicks to the body, to the head are going to be very effective. And I think Izzy's ability to land, slip, and then create create new angles for shots is just amazing. And when he starts to go forward on Rob, I don't really see Rob being able to catch him or take him down. And I just think Izzy's going to pick him apart, man. I think that after he gets his range, after he starts to get his feints going, I think that Whitaker is going to be trying to use all these big attacks, Superman punches, big overhands to close the distance, and I think Adesanya's going to see that coming. I think that he's going to start countering him clean. I think you're going to start to see Rob start to, you know, respect the fact that he's getting countered clean. I think that for Whitaker, I think he needs to get a first-round knockout in this fight or just constantly eat shots, continue to come forward, and um, just force Israel into making a mistake with his forward pressure and his toughness. But, you know, if this is going to be a striking battle where these guys are going to just strike it out, man, 
I just think that Israel is just on another level on the feet. I think that Israel is longer. He has better combinations. I mean, his kicks are just amazing. Those, His ability to throw head kicks. I mean, he was throwing front knees up the middle. He was hurting Kelvin so bad. And in that fight, I mean, I think it's a little bit overblown, the um, success that Kelvin had. He landed some big shots that hurt Israel Adesanya, especially in a couple rounds. But other than that, I mean, he got utterly dominated. And I think that Calvin is punching power is being a little bit underrated here, whereas people are talking about, like, Whitaker, if he lands clean, then he's going to knock him out. Like, Calvin has no power. But, you know, Whitaker gets a lot of these knockouts with his kicks, and I just don't think he's going to be able to land any head kicks. If he does uh, land a head kick like Calvin did and knock out Adesanya, that would be incredible. But just because... I just don't think that Rob has that other dimension, man, to threaten with the takedowns, to get any takedowns. I think that Adesanya is going to be very comfortable. I think this is going to be a striking fight. And I think for Whitaker to win, he's going to have to bring a lot of pressure early, get that first shot knockout. But I think that what's going to happen is that they're going to start out, um, and it's going to be very similar to Rob Whitaker's fight against Steven Thompson, where Thompson was picking him off at range and eventually knocked him out. And I'm going to say that Izzy makes it look easy, man. I know that's uh, going to maybe rub people the wrong way that I say it that way. And I know that people are probably going to disagree with me, a lot of Whitaker fans. But I'm going to say he gets a third-round KO. Um, and I'm pretty confident that Israel Adesanya goes out there and becomes the new champion in this division. But for my most confident pick of the week, it's going to be Maki Pitolo to get the job done. And for the parlay of the week, I'm going to say it's going to be Maki Pitolo and Jake Matthews. So hopefully we can hit back-to-back parlays of the week. And like I said, make sure to comment, like, subscribe. Uh, tell me who you're picking. Give me some shit if you don't agree with my picks. You know, give me some props if you agree with them. And, you know, just everyone have good vibes on there, man. No need to be talking shit. No need to be, you know, doing any of that craziness. But, you know, just keep it, keep it fun. Keep it, uh you know funny and uh we can kick it out there but yeah make sure to um you know check the video out on ma odds breakers as well uh follow me on uh, twitter and all that and uh, thanks for watching thanks for supporting and um you know hopefully we do well on this card and it's going to be a hell of a card so i'm really excited for it so let's have fun watching these fights